Going live. Hey, good evening on a Monday Night Live, the Randall Carlson podcast. We've got Randall Carlson here tonight and our friends from Nashville that are going to host the Sacred Geometry Workshop coming up in two weeks. So we're just going to let these guys chatter on about sacred geometry and Freemasonry and uh, potential school and whatever seems to come up along the way. So welcome, guys. Good to have you again. Hey, thanks for having us. Great to be here. Randall, rock and roll. You mean well, I have we'll to also, talk now? I, no, well, I mean, I'll, I'll say that the Snake Bros are deep into harvest season, and they've had long days and getting up super early, and uh, I told them that I would figure this out and relieve them. So I'm going to try to monitor the uh, chats, and uh, we got a few questions. We may get to some later on, um, but I'm just going to kind of step aside like the Snake Bros do and let you guys uh, have a discussion here, so. Sweet. But Brad, we don't want you to feel excluded though. So if you want to throw your two cents in from time to time, please, it wouldn't I, be the I same sure, without I sure a few will, words from you. Well, I'm just going to be stressing because this uh, control panel here is giving me all kinds of messages that I'm not used to looking at while, while I'm so, on the, the deal here. Everybody listening in, bear in mind that Bradley is filling in for both Russ and Kyle, both Snake Brothers, and this is a, a big step up for him. And so please, let's go easy on him if there's any technical glitches, um, but hopefully not. And so I he just, deserves double the tips as well. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Righteous. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I just, it's it's very difficult and challenging for me without having Russ here to do the intro because I'm now habituated to his intro. And somehow, once the way he delivers it, it gets my adrenaline up and I'm supercharged and ready to go. But you know what? I'm almost there. So, and seeing you guys in that beautiful lodge room. Yeah. Yeah, that's how still let, let me ask you now. Do I understand this, Ryan? Okay. Well, wait, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Ryan on the left, Warren on the right. Ryan, yep. who are you? I am Ryan Turbyville, and I am the worshipful master here at West Nashville Phoenix Lodge. Yep. I'm Warren Sturry. I uh, we're both in Nashville. I'm uh the junior deacon of West Nashville Phoenix mm -hmm. Lodge and an entrepreneur here in Nashville. How about that? So <clears throat> am I understanding this now that the lodge room you guys are in is still a work in progress? Yes. So we've uh, totally renovated our building, uh, finished in, uh, let's see, February of 2020, right in time for COVID. No. So we've uh, we finished the building, but I'd like to say we're just now, this is the first year where I feel like we've really hit our stride being back in this new beautiful building. So Part of that renovation was to design the space in a way where it will function as an active lodge and a place that the brothers can use full time, but also as a private event venue and uh, which we have branded as the Hive at Freemasons Hall. And this room that you're in is set up as a rod as a lodge right now. But this is where the Sacred Geometry Workshop will be hosted. Oh, right there in the yep. in the lodge. Wow. Yep. <clears throat> OK. So we're not going to be in the hive. <laughs> no, right. Okay. We'll be but eating the in the hive. We'll be yeah. eating in the hive. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there's going to be four meals that come with, if you've purchased an in-person ticket, we'll be providing four meals. So workshop in this room, mm. and then we'll have a mm. separate <clears throat> large room where we'll do breaks and meals. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be interesting. So I guess since you guys are sitting there in that room, I mean, why don't, why don't we say, let the people know that this is what's typically called the Blue Lodge. Yeah, correct. And why is it called the Blue Lodge? Well, um, I mean, you've got a <laughs> pretty good hint up there on the ceiling. Yeah. So most we lodges. We can't we'll quite all... see the ceiling, but, but yeah. maybe you could explain what's up there. Yeah, all <laughs> lodges are laid out. Uh, of course, masonry has a lot of symbolism, right? And all lodge rooms are laid out uh, symbolically, sometimes cardinally, uh, in northeast, south, and west. And then the uh, ceiling is supposed to represent the celestial and the floor, the terrestrial, 
mm -hmm. uh, planes. So most lodge ceilings, ours is blue in order to symbolize the heavens. You guys actually have some constellation, a constellation. It, it, what is it, figured with lights? How, how have you done that? Yes, we, we've uh, got one so far. We've got the Little Dipper, which uh, goes to the symbolic north side of the lodge. Mm -hmm. So we have the North Star there in the north. Mm -hmm. And so are you going to add to that as time goes on? That's the plan. We design it in a way where it can be added on oh, wow. to. Yeah. I am looking forward to visiting you in your lodge. So might might say here that you guys are sitting in the east end. We're looking towards the west. Correct. And yep. um, we're seeing the senior warden station down there in the west. That's right. And I notice as I'm looking around, I see the senior warden is two steps up from the floor. And then there's seating around the perimeter, presumably for visiting guests or members of the lodge who are not officers performing ceremonies or anything. And it's one step up. Now, not visible in your scene, but you, is the wor worshipful master station and it. It's three steps up. Correct. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like you said, uh, there's a lot of symbolism. And uh, as I'm looking there to the west, I see two doors. You want to comment about those two doors? Sure. One is our uh, main just entryway. And then the other is what we call the preparation room. Uh, some jurisdictions call it a chamber of reflection. Uh, it's where a candidate... Uh, is prepared before they take on one of the degrees of masonry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for general events, open lodge, the door there on the left would be the door. Who? What's right outside the door? The the um, the door. Our lodge the has there. a station for the tiler. That's for the the tiler's chair, and uh, we also have just some a. Uh, sign in book in an area where the brothers grab their aprons. So you can grab your apron, uh, uh, who, sign in. Uh, and okay. Yeah. Because during lodge, a brother has to be, has to be properly clothed. Correct. And that means donning the Masonic apron, which I strongly suspect goes back to Egyptian symbolism. You think I'm off the mark with that or. I, mean, I would I, agree with you on that. Some masons okay. would not, but you know, there is a, uh, there's also a square and a triangle there, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I'm sure we could get into, uh, as it pertains to the sacred geometry workshop. But, yeah. In fact, there's a lot of geometry in Freemasonry. It starts right with the whole layout of the lodge built lodge room itself. And, uh, so uh, before we get away from it, maybe you should explain a little bit who and what the tiler is. Is he out there laying ceramic tiles on the floor or <laughs> what's he doing? So the tiler essentially guards the door. Now in modern lodges, that's not uh, as big of a, lot, a, a job as it used to be because when lodges were first formed, often they met in taverns. They met in buildings that they did not own. So you might have random guests. Uh, our lodge, we own this building. Uh, you know, we have... <laughs> uh, state-of-the-art locks and cameras and, and all the modern security you may need, but you still have a tiler out there to symbolically guard the door. And then he also will test uh, masons who are traveling guests uh, as they come in to, to prove that they are masons uh, mm -hmm. before they mm -hmm. can enter the meeting. Mm -hmm. And he also assists in preparing the candidates. Mm -hmm. So your tiler <clears throat> has not yet at this point been required to, to slice anybody up with a sword. <laughs> trying no. to gain the illicit entry and we can't talk about all that here you know we're live oh okay that's what we're not <laughs> supposed to be talking about right yeah. okay <clears throat> <laughs> you know to your point randall one of the things that i guess i'd like to say <clears throat> oh, you know when i became a mason i was always intrigued at how intentional every little detail is in Mason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. not only every little word and every little syllable in the ritual itself but also like you say every little step you know, in our Grand Lodge downtown, every staircase has a certain number of step, steps and every one of those staircases is related to something. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that much intention put into not just architecture, but a lot of people don't put that kind of intention into most of the things that they do. So right. I was always impressed with the level of mindfulness that seemed to be put into this fraternity. That's one of the things in particular that 
kind of caught my attention and, and made me really interested to learn more about it. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> what, what you're describing there really points to, to, to what I think you guys, I think we're in agreement that the primary function of Freemasonry, everything else is, a, is essentially trappings to support the primary function, which is education, uh, which includes which by implication, the preservation and uh, custodianship of knowledge in general, at least yeah. as it pertains to certain certain uh, matters of history and so on that are not too well known. But the fact that everything is like you were just saying, Warren, everything has this intention and right down to the finest details. And because what it is, is it's a carefully crafted, you might say the ritual is a type of textbook. And that's the job of Masons is to preserve this tradition. And I think they've done an admirable job. And interestingly, as you guys well know, um, given, which we're not going to get into a whole much at all really today, other than I'll just mention it briefly, and then we can put it aside. And that is some of the more conspiratorial nonsense and hysteria that's been perpetuated over the internet, which, it, which to me is really ironic because it's almost the exact opposite because as you guys well know, as big part of the, the traditions of Freemasonry is to remain apolitical. Yeah. The craft yeah. itself um, rejects political involvement as, as the craft itself. Now, individual Masons are free to do whatever they want outside the lodge, but there is no, the, the craft does not lobby. It does not promote any particular political view or party or ideology. It exists, I think, primarily for the preservation of knowledge and to do good works in the world. And that it does do. And I like to think that it's a it's a system of self-improvement for the individual, mm -hmm. um, but it does so within <clears throat> this fraternal concept or context. Mm -hmm. And it provides a means so that, you know, as I'm working to better myself and Warren's working to better himself and you're working to better yourself together, hopefully we can all have an easier path uh, yeah. together. And then as we improve ourselves, we improve our families, our cities, our communities, our, communities. our country and the world. Yeah. And that's the idea. And, and this is the thing is that masonry is not partisan or, or nationalistic, especially. I mean, I think you find masons to be patriots. There we go. Masons to be patriots, but yet there's still a global network of Freemasonry uh, that's dedicated to the ideals of, of fraternity, of, of brotherhood, of charity, <clears throat> of doing good works. And um, that's not to say that when you have an organization that has, you know, millions of members worldwide, that some of those members aren't going to perhaps be motivated by other agendas, mercenary agendas. What the conspiratorialists like to do is single out any instance they can of malfeasance on the part of someone who may or may not be a Mason and then use that to tar and feather the craft. Yeah. Um, but the point is, as people have to understand, is that Freemasonry is a repository of tremendous riches, and that's a, the riches of knowledge. And everything that you see there in that room is dedicated towards that end of this preservation, perpetuation of knowledge. And this, as Ryan was just saying, this knowledge is very much about the individual bettering themselves and, and bettering society at the same time, uh, bettering civilization. And so a lot of the teachings that come down from through Freemasonry um, are about uh, those ideals. And here, finally, in, in Georgia, let's see, I may have it right here. Um, here in Georgia, we finally had the reconciliation of the Grand Lodges of Britain and the Prince Hall Lodges. That finally happened. Um, I may grab it on a quick break if we do a break. Um, but yeah, this is this is great news. Um, yeah, it's great news. I think it shows that you know masonry isn't perfect and it hasn't been perfect. There's it's an organization that evolves and grows. You're, you're talking about something that, in my opinion, is is at least 500 years old. I personally think it goes back further than that, but that's that's as, the easily provable date. Yeah. Uh, you know, so obviously there's going to be 
uh, an evolution there. But we also have these foundational tenets uh, that don't change. And that's rare in society to have a group that, as you said, is, is above politics or outside of politics. And, and we try to stay out of the division and the divisiveness. And we, uh, we seek truth, you know, this whole idea of, of relativism that's kind of invaded every aspect of society, uh, I think is, is kind of is antithetical to masonry. Uh, doesn't mean that we're right about everything or that I uh, or Warren or you knows all truth, but we at least recognize that there is a truth and are trying to seek it. <clears throat> uh, and, and then just this idea of education and knowledge and true education uh, is why we wanted to partner with you on this workshop, Randall. You know, we, we looked at what the Masons of old uh, used to do with their charity work a lot of it was education oriented. They, before there was a public school system, the Masons were getting together and building schools and communities mm -hmm. that didn't mm -hmm. have schools. And while we have a public school system now, uh, you know, I would argue that there's still a lack of education <laughs> and that we, we decided to uh, try to host more events where we could bring knowledge to the world. And, and when we set out to do this, you were one of the first people we thought of, of, of just knowledge that needed to be out there and in a format uh, that preserved it. So we're super excited about this event coming up and we think that it's more in line with the true mission of Freemasonry and our lodge is uh, all the proceeds of the workshop. If you attend in person, all of those proceeds are going to our lodge charities. So we view this as a, a win-win to where we're not only getting important knowledge out into the world, but we're also raising money for charity at the same time. Now yeah. you guys do some disaster relief. I understand. Yeah. You know, Tennessee is very prone to tornadoes and flooding and mm -hmm. it, it seems, uh, you know, luckily we don't have hurricanes and I mean, every, everywhere in the world kind of has their own little thing. Uh, but it seems like every year we have something happen somewhere in the state and, and we'd like to be ready to provide, uh, funds, equipment, food, you know, whatever the need may be. And luckily there's a lodge, typically there's a, over 300 lodges in Tennessee. So uh, pretty much anywhere that something may occur, there's usually a local lodge that's there on the ground. So we like to have uh, funds and manpower mm -hmm. available to assist those local lodges when something bad happens. Uh, we Can also, I butt in for a moment here? here. Um, we're, getting, we're getting lots of reports that the video stream is lagging. Um, it started out, we said we had an excellent connection, but it's not held up. So everybody says the audio is fine, uh, but the, the video is like pausing and jumping. And so I'm, I'm thinking maybe, you know, if you guys had a, uh, like a slide, uh, you guys or Randall, you know, do a share screen and have a slide. So it'll be okay, okay if the one slide is static there um, and it'll probably require less uh, bit rate. And uh, if we're frozen on the little side panel, then that's that's less of a big deal. So, yeah, just maybe if you can put up a, an image of some sort, that right, might sir. be easier for people to tolerate. Okay. I'll try but, yeah, that. everybody's saying the, the audio is fine, but the, the video is buffering and lagging and pausing. What's the solution? Would it put a slide up? Well, yeah, just do a, do a share screen. All right. I could I could do a share screen when you put that up. You guys... technical difficulties, ladies and gentlemen. Bear with us. Well, we could. Uh... Yeah. yeah. So that event's going to be. Well, you guys were talking about uh, some of the disaster relief, and uh, yeah, definitely Tennessee's kind of in a central zone that gets hit pretty much annually. So I'll let you continue on with that. But um, yeah, just this good. idea of charity in general. Uh, and, and what Masons do uh, through charity. Most, most lodges have their individual charities that they uh, participate in each year. Uh, but then as a whole, the fraternity has uh, much larger endowments. Uh, people may be familiar with the, the Shriners Children's Hospitals or uh, the Scottish Rite, Rite Care uh, supports children's hospitals. Uh, most of those are centered around like the Scottish Rite here in Nashville supports the Vanderbilt Bill, Wilkers, Bill Wilkerson Center <laughs> that uh, 
aids with uh, speech therapy and children who have hearing issues. And um, I'd say most of those charities, not all, but most of our charities are usually centered around helping children. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course they're all done for, for free or uh, you know, if, if uh, insurance will cover things, some of those, uh, some of those hospitals will accept insurance, but no one gets a pay, no one gets turned away for lack of being able to pay. Yeah, and I think this is a dimension of Freemasonry that <clears throat> more people need to be aware of, um, because at this point, you know, the Freemasons have not been self-aggrandizing, aggrandizing, or Masons do not promote themselves, or or you know, even solicit membership. So. Uh, it's easy for the activities of the, of the lodges or the craft to, you know, to fall off the radar screen, most people's radar screen, and people aren't aware of the good work that's going on behind the scenes and has been for decades, generations. Um, well, early on, and I'm not sure, I haven't looked at the most recent number, but I was mentioning to you guys earlier that, you know, a number of years ago, uh, I was looking up to understand more about the magnitude of, of Masonic charities. And it, it worked out that the, the various Masonic affiliated bodies were, and this may have been a decade and a half, two decades ago. So it could be more now. I don't know to what an extent it's been uh, affected by the economy or declining members in some of the lodges, but basically the number worked out to in America, about a million dollars a day, every day, day after day, the activities of Masons were raising, um, about that much money on a daily basis. And of course went to multiple charitable venues, but that was the aggregate number <clears throat> that yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Really? Yeah, it is. It is. But of course, when I came in and began to see, you know, the, the efforts that went into the, the, the activities and the events held and stuff in our lodge back when it really was, when I joined in 78, it was one of the most active lodges in Georgia. Um, and of course, when I went in, in 78, I was 27 years old and I was the youngest member in the lodge. And so a lot of the, you know, all of the officers, all of the members, the brothers that were officers, when I came in, they're all deceased now. And, you know, all of the elders of the lodge, um, who had basically were, you know, when I was in my twenties, I would say the median age was probably mid fifties even, you know? So, um, my lodge has declined in membership. It has, um, it was still growing strong. I was master in 1990 and, uh, it was still going strong at the time. And, uh, but it's just, you know, I, I, for one thing, I think probably lodges all over the country have been affected by the lockdowns and the COVIDs and all of that. I mean, I don't know how effectively a, a, a degree would be trying to do it with masks on. Um, I personally wouldn't even want i would prefer to wait until you know brothers didn't have to wear masks to right to conduct a degree because <clears throat> but um yeah in 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 all of the stuff the nonsense and hysteria that's been that makes its way around um doesn't help but um i think anybody with at least some intellectual development some knowledge of history you know a, a functioning reasoning faculty sees through that nonsense pretty easily. And, you know, if they do, if you do do research outside of, you know, the, the Uber conspiratorial sites on, on the internet, you, you can get the reality of, of the whole thing. And, and, um, it's not, yeah, I'd say the easiest thing to do would be to j judge us by our works, you know, yes. uh, by your works, you shall know them. You can, you can read a bunch of crazy stuff online uh, or you can just look at what we actually do. And, and exactly. most lodges are actually way more open than you mm -hmm. would think. You know, you can find a local lodge. You can go visit them at dinner. It's not as secretive as it's made out to be. Really, the ent entire idea that we're a secret society, I think, is, mm -hmm. is laughable. Uh, we all mm -hmm. wear rings. We all have tags on our cars. We put our names on our buildings. <laughs> you know, I don't know mm -hmm. what kind of secret secret group uh has a giant sign on their building posting what night they need. not doing a good job at keeping that secret yeah yeah so now, we might mention however though that within the legacy of the craft there have been times when that secrecy was a matter of life and death yeah and, and still and, today yeah in some in, areas in, 
Yeah, in some areas. And, and, and we should mention that, you know, when we look at extreme fascist type movements and extreme uh, totalitarian regimes uh, in history within, say, the last 100 to 150 years, what always happens when dictators and despots take over, whether you're talking about Stalin or Mao or Hitler or Pol Pot or any number of others, what's one of the first things they do? They shut down the Masonic lodges which yeah. somehow doesn't seem to me that, eh, really, are those the puppet masters there? They're getting, sh- uh-uh. But that's why. Yeah, every, because- everywhere that despotism reigns, Freemasonry is, is under attack. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which, to your point, is, is what makes it so laughable that somehow we are a part of this tyranny or, or New World Order or whatever crazy label uh, someone wants to put on it. Uh, mm-hmm. If anything, we've always been the group standing against that. Um, yes, exactly. As individuals, we we take oaths to to support certain ideals and principles of freedom. Um, really, I, I would argue that what most people consider American values, American ideals, are Masonic values and Masonic ideals. Uh, the country was formed at a time when this Enlightenment era thought which is really ingrained within the fraternity is also ingrained in all of our founding documents. And I think it's really hard to separate, uh, really hard to separate the two. You know, I absolutely agree with that. In fact, when you look at these ideals at, by under which America was founded, you almost look, where was the precedent for those? Where was their predecessor ever those kinds of ideals ever practiced? And when the one place, you can find those those ideals operative was in the Masonic lodges. You know, yeah. things are done democratically, right? One brother, one vote. You get a vote and decisions are made. Um, and that system was, I have no doubt, an inspiration to the founding fathers of this country and the system of governance that they devised. Um, that's my opinion anyway. It was certainly one of the first places in the world, if not the first, that men of different religious beliefs could get together and be equal and not be persecuted for their religious beliefs. Yes. And it's a place where men and in in the co-Masonic lodges, we should mention that there are co-Masonic lodges that are sponsored by the Grand Lodge of France. My wife was actually a member of a co-Masonic lodge a number of years ago. Um, but in any case, the ideal is that when you enter the lodge, it doesn't matter what your station in the outside world is. You are, all brothers are equal. How do Masons meet on the level? So you can be a plumber, you could be a banker. It doesn't matter when you're in the lodge, the, you know, the laborer, the construction laborer might be sitting in the East with wearing the hat. So he is the top man in the lodge and everyone will defer to the master of the lodge. You know, even if it's a billionaire sitting there. And that's another feature, I think, of the craft that that is unique. Um, I read a I read a cool story once and, you know, I've read it in a couple of places. I haven't necessarily fact checked it, but I I read that at one point, George Washington's gardener was the master of his lodge. So in that setting, George Washington would have actually been listening to his gardener for leadership that year. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. That is very interesting. And, and why that doesn't sound to me like it would be such an unbelievable thing. When, let's see, speaking of George, let's see if I've got this here. Um, well, while you're transitioning there, Randall, let me uh, throw in a question that you may get to. Um, yeah, people are asking what degree you are and what does it mean to be a 32nd degree Freemason? Well, it, it simply means that you've, you've gone through the Scottish Rite. The Scottish Rite is where you pick up degree four. Now, the Blue Lodge confers the first three degrees, which is the foundation of the whole system. And you have to uh, uh, go through the apprenticeship degree, the craftsman or fellow craftsman degree, and then um, go through the master's degree. And then you become a master mason. And then all of the um, affiliated bodies of Freemasonry become available to you, which is you know, the, the Scottish right and New York, right. We have a lodge of research in Georgia. We, uh, 
There's also the grotto, which I've never attended, so I, I don't know a lot about the grotto. Um, but the the thirty the degrees four through thirty two is is part of the Scottish rite. And it, tell me if you guys you know if you have a very a, a variant on what I'm describing. But I would say that those degrees are elaborations on the basic core of symbolism that you're presented with in those first three degrees. And they, yeah. it's a series of stories. I kind of look at it as a, a, a mystery play. Imagine you're watching game of Thrones over three seasons and there's what 29 episodes and each point at each one of those episodes, you're given more things, uh, more symbolism, uh, expanded, um, insight into certain aspects of the symbolism, different, um, you know, different, um, subplots of the story, if you want to put it that way. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing that I, one thing that I say, you know, when I'm talking to somebody who's not a Mason or doesn't know much about Masonry, it's, it's easy for us to kind of throw around the word degree because we know what it is, but a lot of people have no idea what we're talking about when we say that. So, you know, the easiest way to summarize it is it's, you know, to me, essentially a theatrical performance mm -hmm. that is put on, which teaches you the candidate who is the center of attention, a series of philosophical, spiritual, and moral lessons. Um, it's like a living book, really, is another way that I put it. So yeah, in the Blue Lodge, we have three of those that we experience to become a master mason. And then if you want to experience more of these theatrical performances, these rituals, these ceremonies, then you can join the Scottish Rite, which essentially takes the foundational teachings of the Blue Lodge and kind of goes into the down a couple rabbit holes and into some of those those cracks where uh just kind of expands on what was really talked about in the first three degrees mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. really realistically sometimes it just overcomplicates it and a lot of people a lot of people join masonry and and they can't wait to go join the scottish right join the york right join all these groups and get all these degrees but realistically you know i'll share this thing uh, our secretary here, Dan Jones, who is a phenomenal, a phenomenal human being, uh, a, a huge mentor to Ryan and I. And I was talking with him once, you know, he's a Grand Cross 33rd degree Mason. He's a member of probably every appendant body that you could join. Right. And a brilliant man. And he said, he said, you know, everything that you need to know about masonry is in the first degree. He said, it's all in the EA degree. Mm -hmm. And to hear somebody like him who has seen probably every single degree and has been all around to say, hey, the EA is where it's all at. I think that there's something to that. So I don't want people to think that, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's just there's a simplicity to the Blue Lodge degrees, those foundational teachings that should not be overlooked when somebody does become a basic. Those are not things to skip over. Um, in search of the Scottish Rite degrees. And I think that that's an important thing to, to say. I'd say the most common misperception is that degree somehow means rank. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a uh, 32nd degree Knight Commander of the Court of Honor, uh, which lets me, I get to wear a red hat. Warren has a black hat. Uh, yep. <laughs> I don't get to boss Warren around simply because... I have a different title or a different color hat. Uh, all of this, one, it's voluntary. You choose to go through these higher degrees. Uh, we refer to the Scottish Rite as the University of Freemasonry often mm -hmm. because it, it simply means you're gaining more knowledge. Yeah. There is no rank. There is no power. There is, uh, you know, a, a, another very common thing we hear as well. Sure, you guys are good Freemasons, but but you don't know about all the bad stuff that's going on simply because you're not high enough yet. I've heard that a thousand so times. So have I. I have. Yeah. Which, uh, which is curious to me because I actually got into a, a, a debate. Oh, this has been, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years ago online with somebody who was saying that, well, you you may have gone up to the 32nd degree, but the, the, the real satanic secrets are in the 33rd degree. And, you know, once they get you in there, then, you know, and it was this whole argument. And I'm going to say, and then, you know, I said, no, and you know this, how? Um, right. Well, you know, that's when you when you get down to the actual nitty gritty is when the whole thing falls apart. So let me see now. You, you probably learned this online and you are who? So let's see. You know yeah. what, a f but, but a few million 
32nd degree Scottish Rite Masons have not figured this out. So they're oblivious until, you know, um, so you were able to deter, you were able to discern through a few minutes of reading something online, what millions of Scottish Rite Freemasonry have completely overlooked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it just well, it gets back to the silliness <clears throat> of it all. I got a, a great photograph here. I was talking about the, the, the treaty of amity and recognition signed in Georgia. And so I, I found, I will hold this up to venerable nice. and distinguished gentlemen here. And this is after this goes back. Now, what this Treaty of Amity and Recognition is, is recognition between the, the, the Grand Lodges of Britain, because we're all chartered under the Grand Lodge of Britain, and the Prince Hall Lodges. And this diver, the, 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 um, the division of these two goes back to the uh, Revolutionary War. And Prince Hall, it might be explained, was a, uh, a hero of the Revolutionary War. I learned something very interesting, though. It's easy to assume that, oh, well, it took this long because there was a bunch of white racists in the Georgia Lodges. And, you know, when I first came in, there was a few brothers who had that outlook. Most of them did not. But, you know, the, 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 the division between the Prince Hall Lodges, the, the, uh, the Black Lodges, you will, and the White Lodges was beginning to uh, come you know, come down at that point. The, the Grand Lodge of Britain was beginning to, to recognize Black brothers and some of the Northern Lodges were, and state by state, it happened. And, you know, of course, with the Southern states being the holdouts. But I made the acquaintance of quite a few um, distinguished Prince Hall Masons over the years. I even attended a few Prince Hall functions. And here's one of the things I learned was some of the, the older brothers of the of the prince hall lodges which i mentioned mentioned were the, the 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 venerable black lodges they were very very proud and protective of their particular heritage and they themselves had no interest in integrating with the white lodges there was the the, the older black masons of the prince hall lodges were as conservative about that as the older white masons but it's the younger masons like these two guys here i'm looking the two fellas here you know in their probably fifties and sixties. So at the time when this was beginning, these gentlemen would have been young Masons, probably in their twenties and thirties. And it was the young Masons when I came in that were of course, totally willing, if not eager to integrate. But so I, I consider that a great step because I've known, uh, worked with and known, um, quite a number of very honorable Prince Hall Masons that I would have been myself very honored to sit in lodge with. So bring up but a, it, it evolved just like anything else. And it did not require, and it took a little longer, right? But it did not require government coercion to do it, to achieve it. A couple of good points there. You, you bring up all these different grand lodges, which some people may not know what we're talking about. You know, masonry is very decentralized in, mm -hmm. in the United States. Every state has a Grand Lodge that is the governing body of Freemasonry for that state. Uh, different countries have their own Grand Lodges. There is no Grand Lodge that rules over America, that rules over the world. Um, masonry, while having the same uh, founding principles and tenets, you know, that, that do cross state lines or country lines, uh, we are very decentralized in our governance. And it, masonry is not the, exactly the same in every state or in every country. And there's right. different uh, uh, policies that exist between these different jurisdictions. So uh, I think it's something that benefits the craft. Uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, one state may be a little further behind on something than another state. And, you know, and then you get these different jurisdictions that might have issues with one another and they have to work those out. But, but overall, I think that decentralization is really, again, another founding American principle, which is federalism. And this, this idea that uh, government works best when it's the most local and our, our lodge systems are designed that same way to where our grand lodges are localized to a jurisdiction. And then the blue lodges, which we are operating or sitting in right now, uh, also have a lot of autonomy as to what they can do. Yeah, 
I, I, and, and that uh, decentralization, I think is like you said, I think that's an important component of, of, you know, it, it, it which has facilitated its adapt adaptation to a changing world. Um, and we think, I think that it's, it's only natural and right that Freemasonry does begin to open its doors a little wider. Um, because, you know, if we go back to my grandfather on my mother's side was a Freemason, um, back, he was in the, in the, uh, the twenties and thirties. I think it was during the depression years though, that he kind of became inactive and was trying to tend to his, his, uh, business as a lumber broker in Louisiana. But, um, it's changed a lot since then, you know, and the world has changed a lot since he, I'm guessing he would have been initiated in the 1920s. And, um, I mean, <laughs> you know, things have changed a great deal since then. And, you know, it, it, there was a time when, um, you know, the, 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 uh, opportunities for forming friendships and camaraderie and so on were perhaps more limited. And, you know, like if my grandfather, when he was initiated, there would have not have been television, there would have been, you know, mainstream media was the radio and that was it, you know? So Freemasonry provided an outlet, I think, for, for men who just wanted to be involved in something, um, you know, but the, the younger generation that's coming up now and has for the last decade or two has had a lot of distractions with social media and gaming and, you know, mainstream media and pop culture and all of this that can be so distracting. And in that kind of environment, I think Freemasonry has kind of faded into the background a little bit. Um, I remember even as a, as a child, um, you know, there was a prominence. I do remember as a child, um, you know, Shriners putting on parades, um, the Scottish Rite, uh, the, the, the circus, when the circus came to town. And that was a big deal. Um, I, we don't see that anymore. I, I, it's been years. I, I guess I know that the Shriners still put on some of their shenanigans, um, but I haven't really seen it recently. And I guess maybe COVID has affected a lot of things. I mean, I know my lodge didn't meet for what, a year and a half. And during that year and a half, we lost a couple of elder brothers that were mainstays in the lodge. And, um, you know, people don't, you know, you get into a routine, you come every month or for every degree, and then it doesn't happen. You know, you, you get sidelined into other things. So my lodge hasn't recovered yet. Um, but that's why it's gratifying to me to see that you guys are, um, you know, active and, and it looks like, uh, is your lodge membership growing? Oh yes. Very Good. Much so excellent. Well, I think that can come around here again. You know, I, um, I got preoccupied with things the last couple of years, you know, I pretty much went religiously for, you know, well over 30 years. Well, you know, yourself, if you're climbing through the chairs, how much time you have to put in, um, but then I, you know, I became the, the, I guess you'd say the foremost lodge lecturer. So each of the degrees that we put on, I would be there to deliver the ver various lectures that go with the degrees. And then, so I've been at least over probably over two years now since I've delivered a lecture and I'm realizing, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm getting rusty. I need to get back in there and, um, and, and give those lectures again, because those, as you guys well know, those lectures are so rich. And, yeah. you know, there's so much in there that it's almost like every time I would deliver the lecture, whether it was the letter G lecture, the Northeast corner, whatever it might've been, um, I would see, I would get new insight. You know, I would, I would see little nuances of, of meaning that I had missed before. And, um, that to me is just one of the most gratifying parts of it is, is you do have this, it, to me, it's like going in the three degrees is like going into the vestibule or the outer court. And even though the, 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 the layout of the whole temple is there, I mean, there, for those that want to get into it, it's just incredibly rich. If you enjoy symbolism and, and, and the legend and the story, the legend of the craft is so rich. Um, and the, the metaphors that have come down to it, uh, you know, there's for people who are inclined to that kind of a, um, of an interest, there's a tremendous wealth there. It's like, to me, for me, it was like opening, you know, a treasure box, a treasure chest. 
and just going, yeah. oh my God, look what's in here. I'm going to spend decades, you know, delving into this. And I have actually. So here yeah. we are. <clears throat> We're about to have a sacred geometry workshop right in that very room on that right. very floor, which right. look at that. That's some geometry right there, isn't it? Yep. It's going to be awesome. We're, we're really excited to host that event. You know, we've, we've done a handful of events here, Masonic uh, and outside of the lodge. We actually had an event uh, just last week. So here's another great thing about basing. We're talking about how it dissolves borders. You know, just last week we had a, a rabbi and a shaman on stage talking about, you know, healthy masculinity in their culture. I don't know where else you're going to find something like that outside of masonry where mm -hmm. people from, two distinctly different cultural paths uh, are brothers and are able to come together and, and share fellowship um, among those unifying principles. So we, we did that event last week, but this event that we're doing with you is by far, I'll speak for myself, but I think I can speak for Ryan as well. Uh, definitely the one that we're most excited to put together, the one that will definitely put the cherry on top of all the other stuff we've been doing over the past two years. And I just think it's going to be incredible. It's going to be absolutely mind blowing. Not only the, uh, the information that, that we're all going to learn, but also just the people who are going to show up to this. It's going to be a really cool crowd. It's going to be a lot of cool people. And uh, I look forward to making a few friends. Yeah, I do too. I'm, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know the town of Nashville better. What, oh, yeah. I, why don't you address the whole, um, you know, it's Sunday after the, after the, the workshop is over, we're going to do a little excursion. You want to tell us about that excursion and a little sure, bit yeah. of background Na to it? So Nashville uh, has the only full-scale replica of the Parthenon in the world. And uh, after we spent an entire weekend with Randall learning these, these introductory principles of sacred geometry, uh, many of which were uh, applied in the building of the Parthenon, we're going to go physically see it, and walk through it, and experience it. Because I think... Uh, <clears throat> One thing about what you're going to learn in this workshop is, is not just uh, how aesthetics uh, influence and, and make things look better, but you can actually feel it, in my opinion. You, you go in these spaces that are designed this way, and, and there is a, a vibe if you want to use the, the uh, more modern lingo. Uh, they just have a vibe, and uh, mm -hmm. we have this wonderful monument that, that is such a rarity to be able to walk through and experience it in person like this. So yeah, um, some of the background on that, uh, Warren can get into, feel free to jump in, but uh, Nashville's original nickname was the Athens of the South. And it was because uh, of all of our uh, centers of higher education. We had more universities and colleges in Nashville than anywhere else in the South. And that was intentional. Yeah, a lot of the, the, the leaders of the city at that time wanted to set it apart by putting this emphasis mm -hmm. on learning. And one of mine and Warren's mission and this lodge's mission and what we're part, the real reason we're partnering with Randall on this is we want to get Nashville back. To that. We want to be a beacon of learning and enlightenment. Again, we want to be the Athens of the South and have uh, impact not just on this lodge or this neighborhood we're in or our city, but, but truly have an impact on the world by uh, creating a, a center of learning. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of that goes into what Randall's trying to do with the school and his larger product. But even on this small level, what we're just trying to do here at this lodge in Nashville, Tennessee, is, is live up to that ideal of being the Athens of the South. Yeah, and I got to say, I'm actually excited about the idea of participating in that revival in any way. Yeah. And, you know, been intrigued by Nashville for a number of years, wanting to know more about it. I was even talking about it with my wife. And then this was before you guys contacted me. And I just even been discussing what's the deal with Nashville. I've been hearing some interesting things about Nashville and what's going on there. And then you guys reached out to me. And it seemed kind of fortuitous in a way. So I thought, well, I guess I'm going to find out more about Ash Nashville. Because I have been up there. Bradley and I uh, did come through there and made it a point to visit the Parthenon. The day that we visited, though, there was a wedding being conducted inside. And um, our, our wedding crasher skills weren't 
too well developed. So we didn't get in there uh, to see the inside. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, oh, yeah. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, I mean, the inside, you know, not only is it the only full-scale replica of the Parthenon, but it also contains the largest indoor sculpture in America, which is a, uh, I believe it's a 41 and a half or 43 and a half foot statue of Athena covered in eight pounds of gold leaf. So it's uh, awe-inspiring. It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and like Ryan says, you know, when you go inside there, it's, it's not just a beautiful place to look at, but you actually feel it. You walk out of that temple with uh, a sort of glow and there's a really nice park set out around it. The mm -hmm. story behind that building is fascinating. I mean, in, in 1897, uh, Nashville threw a centennial exposition, which is essentially to celebrate a hundred years of Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like one of these world fairs where they build all these buildings out of plaster and wood and then tear them down six months later. It's funny because a lot of the buildings that they built out of plaster and wood back then look better than a lot of the buildings that we build out of concrete and metal now. So they, they, they built uh, 183 buildings, temporary buildings. And this was a six month exhibit. You know, people would come and show off their inventions. And it was like this whole thing. There's pictures of it online. Just look at the, Centennial Exposition for Tennessee. And they built a pyramid um, in the Parthenon. And, um, and at the end of it all, they started tearing stuff down. And the people in Asheville said, hey, you know, I don't know exactly what they said. They probably didn't use this, this wordage. But they said, you know, we can't tear this down. We love this too much. So they let the Parthenon sit there, made out of wood and plaster for almost 20 years. And it was falling apart by the, uh, you know, Coming up on 1920, it was falling apart, so they decided sure. to redo it with concrete. And that's the Parthenon that we see there today. Now, they did the statue of Athena on the inside. That was Alan the Choir, whose studio is actually not far from here. He did that in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that building has a, a, a fortuitous history behind it as well. I mean, it was almost demolished, and now it sits here over 100 years later as the beacon of the city, in my opinion. Uh-huh. Well, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing it again and, and being able to tour the inside. That's going to yeah. be incredible. Um, you, uh, yeah, it really does. You can almost, you know, you get a sense of, you know, I mean, I have not been to the Acropolis yet. It's on my bucket list, but I haven't made it yet. But, you know, in some ways this is, you know, has its own um, value, particularly because it can really give you a sense. I mean, you are looking at a, a ruined temple when you're looking at the actual Parthenon this, you're kind of getting a sense of what it would have been like in its glory days, you know, air conditioning and everything, air conditioning and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, are there Indoor any plumbing? seats left to be have, part of the in-person class and be able to take that tour of the Parthenon with you guys? There's some, we have eight left. Yeah. So if you guys are listening to this and you want to come to Nashville, and hang out with Randall and us for a full weekend, which will probably be one of the coolest weekends of your summer. There's eight more opportunities to do that. And then we're absolutely at capacity. So I'd strongly encourage y'all to, uh, what, what website? Ancientartofdesign.com. You guys are on the live. Or RandallCarlson.com. And he's actually got it all on his website. You guys the are links are right here in the description. Yep. Yeah. If this sounds interesting to you, Take action. Don't wait because those tickets are probably not going to be available for much longer. And if you can't make it, absolutely join the live stream. You know, that's I think, right. I think there's going to be a lot of value in that. You can follow along uh, even if you're not here. So absolutely. Yeah. So what I was thinking was that I would use this live stream. It, it'll end up being maybe 10 hours, I guess, you know, between the Saturday and the Sunday of, of instruction somewhere in that ballpark. But sort of an introduction, you know, getting into the basics, getting into some of the juicy stuff, of course, but I'm seeing it as kind of a kickoff for in a more extended class, you know, that because really, you know, there's the, the subject matter is so rich that you can't, you couldn't even be, begin to just, you, you're scratching the surface in 10 hours. Um, and, you know, the whole art and science of sacred geometry very much is about the the the, um, the manifestations of these principles. So, you know, we're kind of orienting this when you say the the, the ancient art of design, and I've always kind of taken the um, 
the well, like here's here's the manual that I used to use my regular classes. You see a practical manual. So the idea was, how do you take these principles and render them in such a way that they can be used practically to make a more beautiful and harmonious environment? And uh, you know, obviously, architects and artists have used the principles of, and builders have used the principles, but you know, over the years when I've done courses and classes, workshops and things, I've had a whole broad array of people doing different things with this, uh, with this material that they're learning with these principles they're learning. And, um, I've had quilters, um, that made beautiful quilts out of, uh, the, 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 the um, well, a, a good example is look at that floor behind you. You know, now that's something we won't do that particular drawing, but that's a geometric exercise right there that's in, in its execution is highly instructive, but I've had stained glass artisans, uh, take the course and make using beautiful, you know, turning it into beautiful, um, um, uh, um, works of stained glass. I've had, uh, gardeners and landscape architects who've taken the course and been able to apply some of the principles to, you know, laying out a garden and using sacred geometry in there. Um, I mean, the list goes on. And now, of course, when I first started doing courses and classes in the 80s, 90s, you know, the digital medium wasn't really a part of the whole, um, you know, the, the, the whole um, body of study. But now I'm trying to do more where if you're a designer, you know, using 3D modeling or CAD programs or anything like that to to there will be actually in the extended course that I'm working on, there will be, you know, how to use these principles digitally, you know, um, if you're using, a, cause I use a, like I use 3d modeling software. I do have an architectural program that I use. And so it has a CAD program. So I'm going to demonstrate now this won't be in the workshop, but this would be in the outgrowth of that. Um, but yeah, so my point being is that, you know, there's many applications of this and it's, probably only limited by one's imagination. Anybody who, who's in any kind of a creative endeavor, or creative field, I think could find, um, you know, if you're any kind of a designer at all, I think you can find um, applications of some of the basic ideas. Now, in 10 hours, we're only going to be able to, to lay the groundwork. So it, it's one of those subjects that it, as you get into it, the deeper you get into it, the more interesting it gets because you begin to see the, 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 the broad spectrum of connections and interrelations among things that only become visible now when you have this some concept of this geometric uh, matrix of creation. So, yes, of course, the, the principles are going to show up in art and architecture and these other things like this um, that are the products of, of human enterprise and endeavor. But at the same time, they're found all throughout nature in the living realm, in the crystalline realm, in the realm of the terrestrial, in the realm of the microscopic and, uh, and in the realm of the macroscopic. Now, these are the things we explore once we have the basic tools and we won't, we'll, there'll only be, only be a limited amount of that in the workshop, this coming, uh, this coming workshop, because, <clears throat> because again, part of what this is and the way the process works is when you have, you know, the compass and the straight edge and you're drawing and you're, um, you're immersed in that experience of doing these drawings. You're basically integrating the hand, the eye and the mind. It, it involves this, all of those. And, and, and it's through that integration that you begin to understand that I think that these, the, that the fundamental forms and proportions or relationships found in these geometric patterns and diagrams are actually intrinsic to our own consciousness. And, and it's that that has led me to always ask the question, when you see cultures throughout time and, and, and around the, the face of the, the globe, creating these widely diverse um, um, forms, whether it's, you know, primarily in my case, it's going to be buildings, architecture, temples, and so on, that, that can be in their outer form are very distinct. You're not going to mistake a truncated monumental earthwork pyramid in Ohio for a Greek temple or an Egyptian temple or a, a, a temple in, in the Yucatan or one in, in Southeastern Asia. But underlying all of these 
you know, or Stonehenge or, or any number of megalithic structures, but underlying, and here's to me, the incredible part is that underlying all these outer forms, it's a common template and it all derives from these set of basic geometric principles. And, and of course the, the, the key objective in all of this was the attainment of harmony. That was the idea the attainment of harmony and naturally as a byproduct of harmony, you had beauty and, one of the, of course, one of the most prominent places we find, for example, the so-called golden section or divine proportion is in human anatomy, you know, right in our own, the structure of our own bodies. I mean, if you hold up your hand and you look at, you know, the spacing of the joints in your fingers, it's, it's the golden section. It's, it's a whole series of expanding golden section or divine proportions. Um, you can look at your, your cubit. I always like to point this one out, the cubit, which is uh, elbow to fingertip, right? That was the traditional cubit. And it divides, there's a spot, anybody can find, if you feel around on your wrist, and there's mine, there's a, there's a place called the space of desktop. And it's a, like, it's right there in your wrist joint between the bones. You can actually find it. it's like maybe... Ryan, you might not have one, but hey, what are you doing, man? You, <laughs> did, he's teaching. He's teaching you right now. I got it. You found it. Okay, yeah. so what? What that's doing? It's dividing your cubit in a very special place, and in fact, it's dividing it in the so-called golden section, which is if you mm -hmm. take a length and you divide it asymmetrically, you create this dynamic relationship. Now, imagine that you've got. Uh, a, 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 an unmarked, unmarked straight edge. We've got a little slider on it where we can move it uh, to the end and it's just one length or we can move it to the middle and it, it bisects it. Now we have two equal lengths or then we can slide it either one way or the other. And as we move it, it'll create an asymmetrical division, right? Well, within that infinity of possible places that you could place it, there's only one point where the relationship between the small section is to the large section exactly as that large section is to the whole line. That's the magic point. See, that's, that's that golden section, the divine proportion. And so you start with the small, it, the small is to the large as the large is to the whole. And you can, you can also create a series of infinite subdivisions so that each increment has within it that same proportional um, relationship, or you can expand it. And this is one of the things we'll, you know, we'll be doing. And, and of course, you can explain it all, you know, from now until the cows come in. But you, the way to really get it is to draw it. And so that's what we'll do in the workshop is we'll be drawing that. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to see it for yourself. And then we'll create a series of rectangles and it will show how you can divide those rectangles harmoniously. And then we'll show examples of how, um, this geometry was used in, in, by artists and architects and builders from ancient times to the present and hopefully inspire people to want to get into it deeper because basically it's like, imagine you got a textbook and that textbook is 500 or a thousand pages, a big textbook. And you've got maybe the first chapter or two, that's what we're going to be able to get into this weekend, but you don't get into the rest of the material without getting those basics down. And so this is about the basics. It's about, you have to understand that geometry is a language unto itself. It has its own alphabet, its own grammar, its own syntax. And so what I'm trying to do in this course and in the courses I've developed up to this point is we start with the basics, which is here, let's learn the alphabet. And then we'll start combining those, those elements, those letters of the alphabet in various ways and see what's produced in the process. <clears throat> but obviously, you know, you have basic words, you know, that's, that's pretty fundamental, pretty elementary, almost maybe grade school levelish, but you can't get into the higher stuff without some mastery of the basics and be able to read the language and then to be able to go out into the world and read that language in the landscapes around you, in the sky above you, in the flowers, the trees, the growing things, in the buildings, the art, because that actually is everywhere about us, but it's largely invisible unless you've been trained and developed that eyesight to, to, to behold it and witness it.
So that's what we'll be doing this weekend. And then if if you if you if you um purchase the live stream, you 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 know, even and, and here's the thing, if you even if you can't make the live stream, go ahead and get it anyway because it's going to be available. We'll record it and it'll be available in perpetuity. And you can listen to it. You don't have to actively participate. You can just listen to it. But um, my brother has put together an Amazon store with all the supply you guys have, are going to be providing as part of the workshop this weekend. Yeah. You will provide, be providing the supplies, which includes um, all of the things that you people will need to effectively participate. If you're going to do it online, if you want to do the live stream or get the re- aftermarket recording version of it, we have a Amazon bundle of all of the supplies and minus the compass. But if you buy a ticket, we'll see, and you, you go ahead and, and buy the supply bundle, your Amazon will ship to you everything, but the compass, and then we'll send you the compass. And now you'll be set to go and you'll have everything you need. If you decide to go further and deeper into this, into this realm of sacred geometry. And the other thing I want to say is that, look, if, if you've got friends or, or family members, or if you're parents and you've got kids and you want to like, go ahead and get the live stream or the, the recorded version of it and participate as a family, uh, we've had, this is something that's been occurring more recently in some of the workshops and classes that I've been doing. And that is that, you know, parents and, and children can, and their, their children can participate together and it can be a really satisfying, enriching, enriching experience to, to bond together over this really amazing story. And, and I mean, if, if, if you, if you are a parent out there who is sitting your kid down in front of Randall Carlson and teaching him sacred geometry, you are winning at parenting. I just want to say that it's like, Thank you. that was not how I was raised. And I don't know where I would be if that would have been how I was raised, but if you're a parent out there who is bringing your kid to the live stream or to Nashville, like super a plus to you, because I think that's awesome. Well, I want to encourage more and more of that because that to me is one of the major deficiencies of this modern, modern system of education that we've got, you know, um, in, in traditional cultures all over the world for, for generations, the primary teachers of young people were their own parents. Uh, and it was almost expected that, like, for example, a father would teach his son about life, give him useful skills in life, not necessarily that the, the son would have to follow in the exact footsteps of his father, although that certainly could happen. But we've, we've gotten away from that. We've turned over the education of our children to the state. And I want to recapture some of this where um, parents can learn things right alongside their kids. I mean, I've had 10 year olds with coming in and taking classes with, with their grown up parents and the 10 year olds then end up uh, actually becoming my teaching assistants and, and getting it faster than their parents are getting it, you know, and now they're teaching their parents. Well, no, this is not how you erect a parallel line. And they're there, you know, telling their parents the correct way to set up parallel lines. <clears throat> But it, it, it can be a, a, a the, the material in the story that comes out of it is so amazing in, in itself. But then this adds a whole other dimension if, if you share this, you know, as, as a family. Or, you know, if you have a group of friends that are interested and you guys get together and, over, you know, um, buy it, buy one ticket and get five people in the room set up with their, your drawing pads. Of course, you'll have to buy the supplies for everybody to participate. Um, but, you know... Um, I'm hoping that what we can do out of this is it can become sort of the pilot program from which we can launch a whole new series. Uh, I attempted to do this a number of years ago. Regretfully, the situation didn't work out. I don't want to get into that right now. Um, Certain people that I was working with had their own agendas and uh, my efforts to, to, to put a, a really high quality, very focused, uh, program out there to, you know, inculcate a whole set of skills and so forth. What we're trying to do now, I actually tried to do a decade ago and regretfully it, it, it didn't materialize, um, for a lot of circumstances, but now it's a different environment, different milieu, 
different people involved. Um, and I think we share the same agenda, which is to get this knowledge out there to a wider audience and to, um, you know, the idea again of education that you guys are um, promoting here so effectively. Yeah. And, you know, I really couldn't think of a, uh, a better hub for the rebirth of your work in this way to take place than the Athens of the South, Nashville, Tennessee. I mean, it's, it's almost prophetic in nature. So I'm excited yeah. to see, you know, not only how this workshop goes, but what comes out of it, who knows? <clears throat> um, I think we have an idea of, of, you know, what could come out of this. And I think yeah. that that's a beautiful thing. And I, I would love nothing more than to see that all come together. Randall, you uh, touched on this, but I, I'd like to maybe expound on it just a little bit because I've sure. had people ask me, well, well, why should I care? Why, why is sacred geometry something that matters to me if, if I'm not into design or if I'm not an architect or anything like that? And I, I think you really hit it when, you're, when you speak on this idea of harmony and ultimately beauty, uh, because as I see it, we, our modern world uh, seems to not value that as much. You know, uh, there's, there seems to be a, a lack of beauty, a lack of intention and, uh, this does influence all of us, whether you are a designer or not, whether you work in this, you, you live in this environment that we create and an environment that lacks beauty, that lacks harmony is mm -hmm. an environment that, that causes a lot of chaos and disorder and, and, and negative effects on people. Absolutely. On a, on a much more potent level than people would realize. And yeah, I, I just think that, that the reason this knowledge has to get out there and needs to get out there is because we have to return as a culture to valuing beauty and putting an mm -hmm. emphasis on beauty and harmony. And uh, hopefully, or not hopefully, I, I think that this is the beginning uh, of providing people with the tools to do so. Yeah. And the fact that you guys now are, you know, really emphasizing and promoting education as an ideal and an idea at the same time, you know, I've been starting to come out publicly with that, you know, uh, specifically only because, you know, I, I had the, the privilege of organizing classes for young people who were being homeschooled for about 15 years and begin to see for myself what the outstanding difference um, between kids that had not been thrown into this maelstrom of, of, you know, basically indoctrination, which is what modern education has devolved into and the relationship between young people and their parents who are being homeschooled was one of the remarkable things that I observed. Um, the, the, it was just one of more, much more mutual respect. The parents weren't somebody, you know, who was other and you took all of your, you know, your moral and, and, and cues and your conceptual framework from your peers, which is basically what we have happening in this hierarchical stratified system now that's being imposed on the majority of young people going through the educational system. And um, in my classes, I would have age ranges sometimes from nine years old to 17 years old. And there was a natural dynamic that took over. And I also, when I was teaching classes, I mean, I, I would teach regular Euclidean geometry so that these people would, young people would, would have command of, of, the, 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 the system and the, and the, the, the um, subject matter of geometry. So if they were to go and test, they would, they would know the basic principles. But of course, I also got into these other dimensions, you know, like, because how many kids go to school now, take math courses and go, what am I going to, what am I going to do with this? You know, my parents don't use it. You know, what am I going to need to, to solve an equation for, you know, why? Well, I tried to show you that, you know, if you learn some basic tools, your creative imagination will find ways to use those in your life. And I try to show the practical side of this knowledge. And that's why when I was organizing classes, I would regularly do field trips and take the students out into the field. I would regularly in, in for, for various kinds of excursions. And I would regularly bring them to my jobs and show them how, we were using the mathematics and the geometry that they were learning in the classroom out in the field. And I would take them out and have them actually help me. Like, for example, lay out 
a, a building, lay out, put out the batter boards and run the building lines and use geometric principles to get everything aligned properly, get the proper angles, get the right angles and corners set out properly, how to um, calculate, for example, how much earth we may have to uh, excavate and, and move or how much concrete we are going to need for these footings and, you know, what kind of how we use the angular relationships of, of rise over run when we're figuring out a set of stairs or a roof. And so I tried to, to, to show them through practical excursions out into the field on a regular basis, how this knowledge was being used now. And then I would also give them assignments like this. We would have a, we would have a, a class where we're say, for example, we're looking at a root two or a root three rectangle that we've learned to draw in class. And then we're looking at how a root two rect rectangle may have been used as a template to lay out an a painting by a, a famous artist or to lay out a building. And then I would give the assignment of, okay, here's what your assignment is, is to use this, root two relationship or this root three or whatever it might be, this golden rectangle and come up with a design. It can be anything you want. You, if you want to do a design, that's going to be a house and you show how you're going to subdivide the rooms according to these. Good. If you want to do a sketch or a painting, fine. What, whatever you want to do. If you want to do something abstract, if you want to do an anatomical rendering and try to show in there, where the golden proportions are, however you want to do it. And so I would give them a wide range of latitude. And then, of course, if we went far enough after we had sort of semi-mastered the, the two-dimensional expression of geometry, you know, learning about the polygons and the various shapes and so forth, then you take it to the next dimension, the le next level. And it really is interesting because what it begins with is you start with two-dimensional patterns, like on a piece of paper, and then by folding those sides up, you begin to get develop the, the solid figures, the three-dimensional figures. And then you can begin to see how everything from, you know, molecules to crystals up to relationships in galaxies and in the solar system will have those same principles. And so we'll look at things like Kepler's model of the nested platonic solids defining the, the uh, orbital distances of the planets, for example. And that's to me what makes this so interesting is because it really is like this ultimate unifying insight into things. So we might look at how to create a pentagon, how to create a hexagon, how to create both a hexagon and a pentagon out of a single diagram of a vesica, and then how that relationship, that connection between the the, the pentagon and the hexagon yields up the perfect representation of the molecular geometry of the DNA molecule. So it, and to me, that's what the most wondrous thing about the whole thing is, is you can find it in the petals of a flower. You can find it in the rings of a tree. You can find it in the spacing of the planets. You can find it in your own body. You can find it in great works of art. You can find it in great works of architecture. You can find it in, Islamic mosques, in Vedic temples, in monumental earthworks in the Ohio and Mississippi river valleys. That to me is what's so astonishing about it. And it's almost like a hidden language that's there waiting to be recognized and waiting eager to then reveal its story. But you've got to have the ability to read that language and understand it. It's unfortunate because, you know, you know, my, my geometry teacher did not do as good of a job as I suspect uh, you would have done if you were my geometry teacher. So, you know, like I, I my public school experience was I now have an aversion to math. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, this is this is boring. This is not fun. This is tedious and not fun for me. So I come out of public school and that was not my mindset. Geometry was not this thing for me to explore it was this thing for me to avoid at all costs, yes. you know, and, and, and maybe that's, maybe that paradigm is, is part of the problem. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. And it, it had, I actually loved geometry as a little kid. And then I got into eighth grade geometry and basically pretty much the same reaction as you did. 
my God, this is boring. You know, how you, you, you know, you can present in such a fashion where the definitions, the axioms, the propositions and proofs are so dry, so devoid of any real meaning. Like what in the world will I ever use this for? Yeah. Well, you know what? You're going to get some of that in the workshop because look, if you want to take this out in the field and actually put it to use, you got to be able to do a few basic calculations. That's why everybody will be provided with one of these. And you know, it's, you know, even if you're not mathematically inclined, don't go, oh my God, look, a scientific calculator, because really we're just use a few keys on here. We will use that key, the X squared key a lot, because that's very easy. And it's inverse, which is the square root key, which is right next to it. So you've got a, you've got a one over X key. So that's simply the inverse. You've got the X squared and you've got the square root. So, you know, like we might put this number in right here. Uh, let's see. Can you see it? Oops. Sorry. We'll go. We'll do it again. There we go. One of my favorite numbers, 144, right? Where do you find 144, Ryan? How about the number of square inches in a square foot? One of the more obvious ones, right? And so if you have a square that's 12 inches on a side and it's going to be 144 inches, but let's say I gave you the problem and I said, you've got a square 144 inches on a side. How long is, I mean, 144 air inches in area, square inches. How long is it on a side? Well, all you do is push that button right there. How easy is that? Whoops. Mm, there we go. Yep. Pretty easy, really. Um, but there are other things we'll do with that a little bit more sophisticated, but you know, it, you know, and I'm sure we'll have some engineers and others that are mathematically proficient, but don't be, um, you know, um, deterred by having no mathematical background because we'll go through and Ryan and Warren, you guys are going to be there to assist, right? Correct. And I'm going to bring in at least one uh, very proficient assistant. I think we're going to need that because we want to keep this moving at a good pace. So if people get um, bogged down or, or something, we'll have somebody right at the at their elbow to keep them moving to show them how to how to do the next step. Because I found that when I'm doing, I'm the only one and uh, we sometimes can get bogged down a little bit because everybody's getting it a little bit uh, different pace. So um, by the way, you know, one of the good things, oh, and people who, who attend the in-house version are also going to get the recorded version. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. We'll still be able to send them a, a, a way to watch it later. Yep. Yeah. So anybody who either in-house or you buy the live stream, you will have it. Now, once you've got the recorded version, the advantage of that is you can watch it at your own pace. You can rewind it and rewatch re something. So to, you don't miss anything, which is totally unlike, you know, what happens in a geometry or math class in public school is, you know, the teacher has this much material they have to cover each semester and they have to go and they cannot adapt their teaching pace to the actual real world requirements of the students. And so you're either you're in that middle, the optimum middle where you might be able to follow what happens is that the higher achievers easily get bored and, and lose interest. The, the slower achievers miss out, they don't get it. And so they fall behind and then you get this small minority kind of in the middle or upper middle, who, for whom the pace is, is appropriate. Right. But in this kind of a learning, you learn at your own pace and you watch it. If you need to watch, you know, how you set out uh, a perpendicular line to a point, say at the end of a given line, which is an, which is a technique we use over and over and over again. Well, you just watch it as many times as you need to. You need to watch it four times, five times, six times until you get it and you master it, then you move on, but not until then. So it's not like um, it's a self-guided educational process. And you, if you, if you buy the live stream, then you will have that recording in perpetuity and you can watch it over and over again. Your kids can watch it. Their friends can watch it. And I think it's a, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I'd say so. I think it's a fantastic deal. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, we need to make it affordable and, and, you know, there is a cost about a little bit less than uh, it's going to be less than a hundred bucks to get all of the supplies, but once you've got them, you know, you, you'll be able to use them through all the levels of, of class, unless you get really, really enthusiastic and you fill up the sketchbook. Um, but it's a large sketchbook. There's a lot of pages in there. We won't get anywhere near filling it up. So you'll have the large sketch pad um, available to use. Let me show you here. Actually, I've got it right here. This is the sketch pad everybody's getting. So there's going to be plenty of drawing room in here. You're not going to run out of space. And one reason I like a large sketch pad like that is because the drawings, particularly as we move on, they can get pretty elaborate. They can get pretty intricate. And you want to be able to draw big, right? Because look, we're dealing with either a pen or a pencil. Well, even a sharp pencil, there's still a bit of thickness to the line, right? Like here we have a, a sharp pencil. By the way, are you guys going to be able to provide an electric pencil sharpener? Put that on your list of... Yeah, we'll we'll get one of those. We'll okay, good, good. Because... I'm very insistent that we, everyone have sharp pencils. If I come around and somebody's drawing with a dull pencil, I get really upset. So that's what the ruler's for, right? In yes. Back. That's, that's the primary, yeah. <laughs> well, secondary function of the uh, ruler. Yeah. <laughs> Got some swords in here too, somewhere. Yeah. Well, okay. Whatever it takes. That's my philosophy. Um, but here's the idea. Even with a sharp pencil, there's still a thickness to the line. Right. And so what happens is, is the relationship between the thickness of the pencil line and the drawing varies so that the pencil, the, the thickness of the pencil line doesn't change as long as you keep your pencil sharp. But if your drawing is little and cramped, then you quickly find out that four or five steps into the drawing, you're already accumulated an error. Because what happens is early in the process, if you make a little error, Okay, but what happens is that little error magnifies each step from there on. So what you try to do is minimize the area and that relationship between the, 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 the drawing lines itself and the size of the drawing. So the bigger the drawing, the less significant that little bit of an error is. And so if you're going to have a little bit of error creep in, let it creep in at the end, not at the beginning, because at the beginning... You get a little off, then the next step is a little further off, and then the next step is a little further off. And what I used to see happen a lot of times is like, let's say we're doing a, a golden rectangle. And I say, okay, if you've got this golden rectangle, and here's the rectangle, knock off a square. What's left should also be a smaller version of the golden rectangle. If you lob off a square on that, you're still going to get a golden rectangle. Well, and people start doing that, and about the third or fourth step in, the rectangle that's left over is not even close to a golden rectangle anymore. But so it's also important to get the good drawing technique down. And um, this is why I want to have a big drawing pad. And I want everybody to have the same drawing pad because I may say, okay, I'm thinking about a drawing, how much space it's going to take up. And I might say, okay, come over 12 inches and down eight inches and draw a circle six inches in diameter. Right. And then if everybody's drawing the same size thing at the same position on their paper, then what that does and the reason is, is we're not trying to impose some kind of unvarying uh, conformity on everybody, but it simply facilitates moving along. And everybody's doing the same thing. And um, yes, it just, it just helps keeping the pace up. And so these are just things I've learned over doing this over years, but um yeah. So if you go online, if you go on to randallcarlson.com, how to, or go on to the, your channel, which is uh, ancientartofdesign.com. Ancientartofdesign.com. Now, do you guys have a link on there to the, to the supply bundle? Uh, it'll take them to how to, if, if they okay. want to purchase the live stream and it has the supply bundle there. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to do the live stream um, and you want to participate, you don't have to obviously purchase the, the, the bundle, but if you want to participate, I would say, go ahead and do it. Now, unless you're an artist or an engineer or something, you've already got drawing supplies and, you know, absolutely you're welcome to use your own, right? Um, but if you're not this, we tried to put a bundle together that gives you everything you need to participate, not only in this pilot 
workshop, but in all the classes to come. So, well, you know, we're super excited about it. I think you mentioned the word revival earlier, this, this revival of the Athens of the South. And we've talked about uh, masonry and its ups and downs. And, you know, you uh, are probably the, the king of, of talking about cycles. <laughs> and I, I do think that, uh, you know, things move in cycles, good mm -hmm. and bad. And yes. that, you know, as it pertains to masonry or Nashville, or sacred geometry and all these things that we're trying to do. I really do sense that we're in a, that upswing of this cycle of where these ideas are on the rise. I think that if you look at our lodge specifically, we've been around 175 years. This is our 175th anniversary. And because of that, we've been doing a lot of uh, a big history project and researching the history of the lodge and masonry has been down the last few decades, but it's not the first time you, you right. go back and you look through our history and things have went up and down numerous times throughout our history. And it's just, uh, just like our live stream here keeps going up and down. <laughs> uh, you'll see, you'll see that, uh, I, I really, really am optimistic about the state of things and where we're going. And I couldn't be, more excited to be working with you, Randall, on, on this project because I view this as just one more iteration of rebirth, of revival, of resurrection, of whatever you want to call it, uh, of these of this knowledge that we're bringing out there to the world. A restoration, we could call yeah. it that. Yeah, and that's a big part of what's motivated me to think about how could we apply these principles to a, a project today, a school. A community. Um, and so that's where my thinking has kind of begun to crystallize around this idea of how we could actually bring these principles um, and create a, a prototype, if you will, somewhere where we take these ancient principles, kind of recast them in a, in a modern format using the tools and materials and processes and technologies available to us today, and kind of recreate what our our forebears on this planet were attempting to do all over the ancient world. And, you know, there's no better, I think, way to summarize what they were trying to do than making reference to the two columns that you see in the background there, um, Yachin and Boaz. And the, the one column, which has the uh, terrestrial globe and the other column, which has the celestial globe. And there's, there's a whole story and legacy behind the origin of those two columns. In some cases, it goes back to the legend of Enoch or the legend of Lamech and the destruction of the former world order and a great cosmic catastrophe and how, you know, either Lamech or Enoch, whoever, whichever version of the story you're, you're, you're um, uh, accessing, you know, knew that this overturn was about to happen or was impending and set out to preserve the knowledge in a, in a buried nine chambered, um, time capsule. And he set two pillars, one to withstand the destruction of the world by fire and one to withstand the destruction of the world by water, which were the two great agencies of cyclical world destruction. And whichever pillar survived was then intended to be able to serve as a, as a, uh, a guide stone to the location of this hidden chamber of ancient knowledge. And I think that's kind of the, you know, you, you have that idea represented right there. And the fact that, you know, Masons are initiated between those two columns to me is very significant. One terrestrial, one celestial. And that is another key component and motive and, 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 goal and inspiration of these ancient builders um, was the uniting of heaven and earth and the recreation of, of, of heaven on earth. And this is why we find so many of these ancient structures all over the ancient world are laid out, not randomly, but according to the order and movement and harmonies of the heavens. And that was the philosophical idea at the basis of all hermetic wisdom, as above, so below for the working of the one miracle. And that one miracle would be, could be any number of things, but on one level of manifestation, 
It's a civilization that's built in harmony with nature, with it, with the, with the celestial patterns of harmony. And um, this has always been a goal, I think, of Freemasons is to preserve that knowledge so that when the day comes that we're ready to, to create that infrastructure that serves as the harmonizing mean between that which is below the terrestrial and that which is above the celestial. When that time is, is, is ready again, Masons will be there. They will have the tools and they will have the knowledge. They will have the blueprints so that once again, we might be able to accomplish the ancient work. Beautiful. <laughs> Just have a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. We've got a lot of work to do, but yeah, I mean, it's time for Masons to pick up their trowels and commence work once again. And I'm well, I think that's probably a great place to be wrapping it up there. What do you think, Randall? Um, I think, I think we, yeah, I think we past our here. 90 minutes, Russ usually jumps in on these live ones and, and forewarns us uh, it's 90 minutes. So uh, I cut out thinking that might help the uh, live stream bit rate or whatever run through, but it's still been just pausing for minutes at a time, it sounds, but hopefully it's going to reprocess itself. And uh, it'll be smooth once it, uh, you know, people that replay it afterward. If not, I've been recording. Uh, I will post that. It won't have the running chat along the side, but at least people can see, you know, you you moving as you're talking in the the screen shares that you did put up. So beautiful. Uh, well, maybe yeah. we can we can fo do a follow up, perhaps um, if there's some. I'm sure there are some comments worthy of addressing and some questions. Um, we didn't get to that, but let's, let's keep that, um, make sure that we don't lose that and we can right. review we'll those mm -hmm. and, you know, yep, there's some good questions in there. I haven't been able to keep up with maybe half of half of it, but, uh, thanks to our moderators, uh, they're working through all that. Uh, they came on on their own without, uh, having the snake bros prompt them. And we really appreciate their participation and in, in moderating that chat. That's a big help. Um, Wait. otherwise, yeah, you guys covered the, uh, the event coming up and, uh, the supplies. So you got through all that good. And uh, yeah, we hope to see uh, that class fill up. Uh, they are great fun and you get the basics and people just, they want more, you know, you just get teased with it and you're like, geez, this is just wide open. You know, I can do so many things with this. It's going to be fun. And, and you meet great people and uh, yeah, we're going to get to see Nashville too. So we'll check you out there in, uh, in that room right there behind uh, Warren and Ryan. That's going to be awesome. And uh, somebody did inquire if women are allowed because it's in the lodge, but uh, we said, absolutely. I know there's women that already purchased tickets, so that's no, no problem. Yeah, please come on. Thanks for having us on the show. And, you know, I look forward to seeing you guys here in just uh, less than two weeks. Yeah, I, I've got uh, some logistical things to talk to you guys about. So in the next couple of days, I'll hit you up and we can go over some of that. Um, just so we can, so the execution of this comes off smooth and, um, yeah. Great. All right. Well, we can wrap it up there and, uh, we'll be doing another live one with Randall, uh, hopefully two Mondays from now, we'll do it again and, uh, see you Warren and Ryan and well, uh, the people that are going to be there in Nashville. Hold on now. Maybe not two two Mondays from uh, now. Two Mondays from now, we've got a. Uh, degree going on in this room that Randall might be participating in. Okay. Okay. But we'll, we'll, I missed we'll, out on that. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep people in the loop on that. Um, all right. Well, yeah, we'll put the notifications out. Uh, Laura and Russ have been doing that hopefully at least 24 hours ahead. So we'll let people know we had to make some adjustments this, this one. So, yep. RandallCarlson.com for all this information, right. And, uh, uh, links in the description to get to the how to channel and purchase the live stream and it'll be ongoing available to you. You don't have to be there live. We know there's people around the world actually that want to tune in uh, and can't be there live. So, yep, it'll be posted. Uh, I think 70 within 72 hours is the limitations. Uh, how tube has said, uh, you know, it'll get processed and, and re-uploaded and available in all your channels, but you will have to make a, uh, a simple how to account to do that. Um, but let's get as many people in there and started in this sacred geometry process. Right? All right. 
Yeah, for sure. We look forward to seeing, seeing a lot of you guys in Nashville, seeing you on the live stream and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, definitely. Looking forward to this very much. So good night, gentlemen. And I'm going to talk to you guys uh, in the next day or two. All right. Good night. Good night. guys. Thanks y'all. Good night. Okay. So now we can say anything we want, right? Yep. Okay.